Okay. Okay, I've just. Okay, we're going to start um, now. Um, after I've encouraged people to go out. Uh, so I'm Andrew Clement. I'm a faculty member at the at the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. Uh, my background is in computer science, actually, and I've had a long standing interest in the social implications of computerization, uh, in particular around information policy issues. And um, most recently, my research has been in the area of, of surveillance. Um, and I really appreciate the invitation to um, appear before you. And I thank you very much for spending uh, this part of a bright, sunny um, holiday weekend um, discussing these issues. I think they're important. Um, I think we're, and I'll talk more about this, we're in a formative stage in the development of, of drone technologies and the things that we talk about and decide, not that we decide much here, but that we talk about here, um, will have some consequence and uh, I think that I re really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to try to keep to 20 minutes um, just so that it's a long day and um, so that so there'll be some chance for you to ask some questions and uh, still have the discussion afterwards. Uh, I'd also like to get a sense of where you're coming from because this will, might help uh, us d d uh, discuss things. And so I'd be interested to know how many people here um, have an ap academic uh, interest, whether you're students or faculty or researchers. Can I see by a show of hands? So, I'm, so a good number of you. Um, how about those who have a kind of commercial interest there? They want to develop businesses or um, and, uh, and journalism, too. Uh, thanks. Um, how about uh, sort of artists or hobbyists or DIY people who want to get into this and start trying things out a little bit? Okay. Um, uh, what else? Um, anybody from law enforcement here? Nope. Nobody. Because originally on the first schedule that I saw, <laughs> I thought there was going to be a, a, a cop. They were yeah, they, they went? They were not allowed to present. Okay, that is really unfortunate. Um, and we'll get into that because, as Avner was saying, we really need um, uh, an engaged public discussion of all of the stakeholders um, to, to set a, a good course here. So what I'm going to do um, is talk a little bit about, uh, uh, I guess, some sort of background of ideas about how to think about um, policy. And I'm going to draw from... Uh, uh, field called the science and technology studies because I think it provides some useful ways of conceptualizing and bringing some clarity to to the issues and how to think about it. Uh, then you'll hear um, some of my thoughts on more prescriptive of, of what kinds of policies we might uh, pursue and then I'll end um, with a brief discussion at least about uh, the policy process and I'll reiterate this point about uh, the need for an engaged public debate in this formative uh, period. Um, so first of all, some basic ideas about policy, and, and I take a broad view of, of that. These, uh, policy for me is, is kind of a prescription for how to act or behave uh, properly or well. And um, we, we, we call or we, we, we try to develop policies particularly in their, those areas where there are complex trade-offs, um, where there are sort of good uses and bad uses, to, to, to use the terminology of, of, that we've adopted for this day. And um, there's lots of examples, prior examples, of things that we absolutely need and are vital. I don't want to think of, of uh, cars, for instance, or um, maybe for some alcohol, um, uh, drugs of uh, various kinds. Um, the end is list, uh, the, the, the list is endless in terms of things that, that we, we value, um, people want, um, that also have potential harmful um, effects. And we try to bring this, um, these, these, uh, these unruly um, and complex uh, phenomena under some kind of, of, of control or oversight or sort of democratic man manageability by developing policies to govern them and so that we can understand what's proper and what's not and how to make decisions about, you know, at particular instances of whether it's appropriate or not. Um, and policies uh, can include um, everything from, say, constitutions. Um, Avner uh, mentioned uh, our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, laws, regulations that give sort of 
teeth are, are affected those laws. Investment policies, uh, you know, where do we put our resources? Um, these sorts of things. Um, they also, for me, include, um, in, in a sort of a broader sense, our cultural understandings. What are the norms that we believe to be true? And those are really consequential because in some ways the, the laws that we enact reflect um, the sense of what is right and proper and, and then we try and codify that. Um, and, and, and also in, in part um, uh, this involves the language that we use to describe things. What sort of coloration do, do, do the terms that we use um, have? Um, and those are, are also up for, for grabs here. Um, the word drone is a very interesting way of talking about these things. I think it's, it has some potency in its own because in some ways it was, didn't have a lot of particular meaning and then it got associated with, very graphically with a particular kind of, of, of shape, a form that uh, circulates in the media and also particular activities. I mean, they, they, they use particularly in, in um, Afghanistan and Pakistan and Yemen and, and so on, that, that when you mention drone, um, people get an idea. Um, but it's, it's a, it's, at this point, it's a, an ill-defined um, idea. And this is where I think um, uh, some ideas from science and technology studies um, come in. Um, the first thing I want to draw attention to, uh, or that science and technology studies would, would help us understand, is that when we're talking about um, an art, oops, maybe that's not the right one to use, I'll use my clock. I mean, an artifact, you call this, this is a smartphone, but it's not a singular device. Um, these devices, of course, and we don't have to tell you this, are the products of very complex uh, production um, systems. Uh, there's uh, many technologies packed into them, and so if you were to draw a network, and I'm drawing here, I speak specifically on actor network theory, um, networks that come together and in some ways make this an object. This object only exists in that context, and you can't separate them out. We can't talk about a sort of a drone as a singular thing. We have to look at all of the actors that um, make that um, that come together. And those actors, of course, are you know the manufacturers, um, the 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 funders, the the, the legal regimes uh, to the extent. Uh, that they, they count, and I think believe they still count a lot. Um, the, the, uh, the, the popular perceptions, um, you know, the physical properties, uh, there's all kinds of things that come together. And I think at to, we need to, to develop some greater clarity about what we mean by drone, or, or more specifically when we're talking about policies around drones and, and what's a good use and what's a bad use of being specific. Um, and I think there were some calls earlier for when Evner was, was speaking, well, what kinds of drones are we talking about? And that might help us, um, we need language around that to be able to distinguish um, between um, appropriate and, and less uh, appropriate ones. So, um, so the, the term that's, that's used is, is, is that it's not just a device but an assemblage um, or the, use the French word sometimes for that. Uh, there's also, um, and as Ian has repeatedly mentioned, we are in a formative period. Um, the, the networks that, that stabilize or constitute what a drone is um, aren't stable at this point. It's not closed. And every technology goes through a, a period of relative openness where people have all kinds of different ideas about what this is going to mean. Uh, classic example of the is the bicycle and, and the technical form of the bicycle, like the penny farthing, um, uh, was, the, was the first one. And, and that was um, in some ways used for, for young men to show off. Uh, not everybody could ride it. Um, the idea of a bicycle as something that could be widely used and it was relatively stable and so on uh, took some time. And you know, we can look at any technologies to, to see that process of stabilization and closure. But once that stabilization occurs, or I mean, it's never quite complete, and it may be reopened, um, uh, the term is used as a black box, it becomes closed and you can't see into it. And then it becomes very difficult to change because a lot of actors become committed to making it the way that it is. Um, telephones were like this for a long time, uh, I guess in the mid, you know, in the 80s, they sort of, they, it became destabilized through new technologies, through digital techniques, and now, you know, 
phones have, have morphed into all kinds of things. Um, so at this point, drones are, are in this sort of unstable, um, sort of reconfigurable stage. And that's why it's important that we sort of get things right now, even though we're we're faced with considerable uncertainty as to what they are and how they can be used. Um, but we need to, I think, act very um, uh, consciously about that. Um, now we're going to sort of talk a bit more about uh, sort of the prescript, uh, prescriptive aspects. And uh, as I mentioned, I come from a surveillance and privacy uh, background. And, and, and so I'm going to talk about that aspect, not about you know, the safety of, of these and, and how you know, uh, Transport Canada should or shouldn't regulate these. And I should also mention that I was originally scheduled to, to be here with um, Anne Kavukian, who is the uh, Ontario's um, Information and Privacy Commissioner and, and is a, you know, a very um, uh, you know, sort of vivid and uh, forceful uh, proponent of certain uh, forms of, of privacy regulation and, and policy. And uh, she would have brought um, I hope she would have brought many copies of this, uh, Privacy and Drones, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, that the uh, uh, Information Privacy Commission here in Ontario produced last summer in August. And it gives a, a very nice account of the various forms of drones and the privacy implications and uh, how to deal with them. And um, she, no doubt, would, would uh, promote her idea of privacy by design that, that Avner has um, has, uh, has, has mentioned earlier. I'm not going to talk about privacy by design. I think it's, it's great in many ways, but it is not adequate. I think there's a whole lot of other issues around, uh, raised about the surveillance and pri privacy aspects of drones that, that uh, can't be addressed by, by uh, privacy by design. Um, but there's certainly a, a, value a valuable aspect to that. Um, so, and I'll, I'll talk specifically about the Canadian context, and I won't deal with armed drones. I said earlier that I think they're just a really bad idea, and there's all kinds of other um, issues with them. Um, but uh, you had some discussion, and maybe we can return to that. So first of all, I want to um, uh, sort of divide up the three kinds of worlds or, or, or user bodies. Um, uh, for the drone application. Uh, police and law enforcement, security, uh, commercial de um, development, and hobbyists. And I'm, I'm not sure quite, I think you, you, well, you certainly fit in the commercial, but, but a journalism is a, is a, a, a kind of a cross-cutting one because I think there's do DIY journalists as well, and they, they, uh, they might have some concerns. Um, so from a, from a security and uh, police law enforcement uh, point of view, uh, the, the standards that are normally required in Canada and elsewhere are for to have a, a search warrant before you take um, such images. Uh, and uh, at the conference, we've, uh, Katina and, and I and a number of others were at um, the last few days, a police officer there talked about um, the uh, dashboard uh, cameras that look through the front wheel shield, shield of, of uh, cop cars here in, in Toronto. And, um, and one of the, the big concerns um, that I think map over and probably will be more c concerning with drones that are, out of, uh, that are uh, not quite so accessible, will be how will people know that there is a drone around um, and that it is targeting, uh, capturing images of, of people. I believe that there needs to be notification about that, um, prior notification, and at the very least, um, we need to have a good public record of where those police drones have been used and what effect they've had, how have they uh, been used. If we're going to make intelligent decisions about how to regulate what sort of laws or, or regulations or standards and so on uh, should be applied, we need a strong base of what actually happens. And a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the measures that are promoted right now as uh, for security purposes, don't stand up to close security, uh, uh, close scrutiny. Um, uh, Ruth Schneier has termed this a security theater, and um, there's certainly a risk of, of seeing that again, um, where, it's, uh, where people believe or are told to believe or that this is helping make us safe, but in fact, um, uh, that's far from the truth. So we need a kind of an accountability in terms of what are the claims made for its efficacy and how do those play out in practice? Does it actually help uh, find, uh, help us safe and so on? 
Uh, the, the next area is, is um, uh, commercial operators. And I've uh, done studies recently, and I alluded to them earlier, about uh, video surveillance uh, cameras um, in public places. And um, in particular, uh, we, did, we looked at uh, the cameras operated by commercial firms. And that, in Canada, is, is uh, covered by an, uh, what's called PIPIDA, which is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. And it covers the handling of personal data in any commercial um, operation. And what we established was that in Canada, um, well, I shouldn't say all of Canada, at least wherever we have looked, um, there is not a single uh, video surveillance uh, operation that complies with PIPIDA in terms of its notification requirements. It's principle eight, it's openness, and it requires that if you're going to collect personal information, you have to notify people. You have to notify people about who owns it, uh, what uh, the purposes are, and how to contact someone who is responsible so you can find out what's happened to your information. Um, that information belongs to you. You have a right of access um, uh, and a number of other rights. Um, the, the, it should, should be, uh, the retention period should be, should be limited to no more than is necessary. And so, so we just looked at the signs and whether they met these three basic requirements of ownership, of purpose, and of contact information, and also the position of the sign that you had to be able to see it, read it, before you entered in the surveilled uh, area. I mean, it's about informed consent. Not, not, I would say, the best standard for this, but at least it's, a, it's one that is in plain language. And we had, have yet to find a single installation um, that uh, meets that standard. And, um, I offered a $100 reward uh, two and a half years ago, and I still have the $100 in my pocket And um, because we have not found any. There's, there's some that are close, and, um, but uh, there's still a chance if, if you want to claim that $100. I, I offer that as a sort of cautionary tale because if there is widespread noncompliance with basic requirements of, uh, about privacy law that can be cheaply and easily implemented, you, you know, put up a sign, it's only a few dollars. Um, we've, on our website, we've got a, a PowerPoint uh, template so you can fill that in, you can print it out in your paper and laminate it, uh, so I don't know, three dollars. Um, you could do that. So when it comes to the commercial use of drones, which are even further away, I mean, they're less sort of visible, they're less accessible, um, will, can we expect that commercial operators will comply with the law? I would bet much more than $100 that we will find widespread, massive non-compliance. And that's because people don't complain, basically. I think we do have the ability to force it, but it needs people to react strongly to it. Short of that, they just ignore it. Um, and I really appreciate, Ian, your um, uh, insistence on, the, your, on a, a difficult um, regime of informed consent. I mean, it's not easy to go around and ask people um, these sorts of things, but I, but I applaud that and because I think it's an indicator that there is something at stake here. It's a reminder that you are collecting per personal information and that everybody has a right to that, um, at least in commercial operations. The, my final remarks um, about these uh, bodies are the sort of the hobbyist DIY group. And it's um, good to see that um, at this point there's relatively little uh, regulation about that. So I think, the, uh, I think uh, your point earlier about that a lot of the, the good uses are going to come from people trying things out and you know, doing interesting things about it and in a way defining what drones or UAVs or whatever you want to call this is. And, and this is, I think is, um, is good to be aware that often they talk about what's the impact of technology, what's the impact of drone technology. We'll, we'll see that. And I think that just reverses the, the, the proper way of thinking about it, is what is the impact of people's activity, the hobbyists, your activities, regulators, and so on, in shaping these technologies, which once they are stabilized, will uh, then you know, have serious effects. And I guess my advice to the DIY community, and as I indicated earlier, I would love to talk to them about my own idea of a, of a drone as an anti-video surveillance device to draw attention to the illegality of them. Um, 
And that is, um, uh, try to set a good example uh, and try to be as open as possible about what you're doing. Um, uh, I would suggest that you um, give, have, say, websites of where you record um, the details of every flight that you can. Um, this is presumably relatively easy to do. And I would extend that, um, you should pro provide a good example, to commercial operators and law enforcement. They should similarly be as upfront as possible about where they're flying, what's the purpose of the flying, um, what's the target, uh, how long it lasted, and then also what effect did it have. Um, Certainly, it, you should mention if, if it crashes, if it falls down, <laughs> if anybody's hurt, um, but also the good things. Um, and, uh, and that, I think, is a, is a tremendously valuable role for, for the, sort of the hobbyists and, and the do-it-yourself um, group. Um, and the, the last point that I want to mention, um, and I'm just out of time here, is about how do policies get developed. Um, simplistically speaking, I mean, they get developed through discourse, through people talking about it, through events mm -hmm. such as this. Yeah, that's my end of 20 minutes. So, um, and so I'll stop very shortly. Uh, it's about talking about it and bringing together the parties um, who are involved. And if we look at the, the, the networks of who's making drones now, making them what they are, giving them the, uh, the meaning and the implications, um, there's a wide array of, of actors. Many of them are are quite powerful and quite uh, secret, but those people need to be, in a way, outed. And I think it's going to be the sort of the DIY people and the journalists and so on who can draw attention to that. And so that we can bring those people together and have a discussion about you know, what are the appropriate uses, what are, are reasonable limitations, um, what are the, 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 the restraints, and where should um, those restraints where should restraints be, be released, like the 21-day notice that for flying, you know? So, so there's a there's a huge area here, and I think um, an, an essential step is that we try to be as open as we can about what we think these um, UAVs, these drones, can be used for, and uh, how we're actually using them, and what the effects are, what the results are, to the extent that we can we can do that. That would, I think, be uh, tremendously uh, helpful and set. A terrific example. Um, so that's what I have to say now. I'd welcome any questions and then we can take a break and uh, we can discuss further. <laughs>